Hello, so in this video, we're gonna continue talking about the Huffman coding that we were talking about last time. In the first video, we talked about sort of data compression stuff in general, like lossless versus lossy compression. And we also then talked about the first part of the Huffman coding algorithm, where you build up a binary tree to represent the code. Now in this video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna see how that binary tree can actually be used to encode the input. And then we'll have a code example going through all of this where we show how to read in the data, build the tree, do the encoding, and write it out to an output file. And we'll see just how good this data compression scheme is going to do. So let's dive in by starting to talk about how you actually get the code words out of this binary tree that we made. Okay, so this is the tree that we built last time, the binary tree for our example sentence, which if you remember was tomorrow morning. Now we'll talk about how you actually generate the symbols for each of these letters that we see in our input. So what we do is we start with the root and every time we go left, we treat that as a zero. And every time we go right, we treat that as a one. And so I'm just gonna label these edges real quick with zeros and ones. So we can see how that's going to work like that. Then for a given input symbol, like the T here, what we do is we follow the path to get to T and record if we take a zero or a one at each step. So to get to T, we go zero, 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 zero. So two, three, four. That's the code for T, four zeros. Then for W, it would be zero, 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 one. For M, it's zero, zero, one. And so notice that M occurred more times in the input than T and W, so it was given a shorter code because of the way that this scheme is working. Next we have N, which is zero, one, zero. Then we have I, which is zero, one, one, zero. G, which is zero, one, one, one to get to G. Then we have O, which is just one zero, and R, which is just one one. So the things that occurred the most time, the O and the R here, got even shorter codes, only two bits. So now that we have this encoding scheme here, we can go ahead and figure out how we would actually compress the string tomorrow morning. We're gonna disregard spaces here. That wasn't part of uh, the code that we built. So for T, we would do one, two, three, four. For the O, we do one zero. M is zero, zero, one. The next O is one zero. The R is one one. The next R is one one. Then the O is one zero and the W is zero, 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 one. So this is the encoding for the word tomorrow. Then we could do the morning part, which would be zero, zero, one for the M, one zero for the O, one one for the R, zero one zero for the n zero one one zero for the i zero one zero again for the n and then finally for the g zero one 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 so this is tomorrow the first line of bits and then morning is the second line of bits so now notice that as promised this code is a prefix code because none of the codes are the prefix for another we have this code that's just one zero by itself. Nothing starts with one zero, if you look at it, except for that code itself. Likewise, nothing starts with one one. Nothing starts with zero one zero. The way that the tree is built, it guarantees that the code is going to be a prefix code. And that means we do not need to put any separators in, even though there are variable length codes in here. So as you're scanning through, you can basically see, okay, nothing starts with zero, zero, zero. So we know it must be the four zero. So we know this is the first code point. And then because nothing starts with one zero, once we get to one zero, we know that's the next one and so on and so forth. And now this might seem like, well, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 symbols in our initial text, if we count all these letters as symbols. And now we made way more symbols out of it because of all these zeros and ones. But keep in mind that in a computer, everything has to be stored as zeros and ones. And sort of like the default way that text is encoded is with ASCII, where every symbol is given eight bits. And so the 15 characters that were given, if we times that by the eight bits that we need to store them, that would be 120 bits total. Whereas these bits, I just counted them up and if I didn't miscount, it was 42. And so by coming up with this scheme and 
using fewer bits to store the most commonly occurring things. And also by coming up with the code where we only create code words for the things that are like actually here in the text, we were able to compress it quite a bit. So now let's look at a program that does both parts of this. It builds up the tree using the algorithm we talked about in la the last video, and then it reads in text and then uses the tree to do the encoding and compresses the data and writes it back out to a file. All right, so this is a little bit of an involved code example, but I think that it will be easy to understand when we go through it. And so the first part of this is this array called probabilities. And this is based on just sort of like standard English text, which letters are the most likely to appear. So rather than read in the text that we're going to be compressing and finding all of how many times each letter appeared, instead we're just gonna use sort of like common probabilities. And this, just like the example that we did on the whiteboard, is only going to be doing for lowercase letters. We could expand it to use capital letters and spaces and punctuation and digits and stuff in addition. But in order to keep it like as simple as possible, I just kept it to lowercase letters. And if you notice, this is the most common one. There's a 12% chance of a given letter being an E. Also pretty high is A with an 8% chance. Whereas letters that are very uncommon, like Q, there's a very small chance comparatively of a letter being a Q or a Z or an X, as you might imagine. So this is used to build up the tree rather than putting like two and three and four for the counts inside of our binary search tree leaves. Instead, we're going to use these probabilities instead. And so we'll combine up the two smallest ones, which I think are Q and Z first, and then we'll leave the later ones with the bigger probabilities like E and A until further down so that the code we generate is going to have more bits to represent the less common letters and fewer bits to represent the more common letters. And so this Huffman tree class is basically building the tree that we built on the whiteboard together. It has other stuff. It creates these node classes which contain the letter that's being stored for the leaf nodes as well as the probability like we talked about. And then here in the constructor, we're doing the algorithm that we talked about last time. We make a min heap of these node objects and push in one for each letter. Each node that gets pushed in has the letter A through Z, whichever one it's representing, as well as the probability of that letter appearing. So again, for E it's 0.12 and for Z it's like 0.00 something. Then we keep looping while there's more than one node, linking them together. So this is a min heap, so it's going to give us the two smallest nodes first, and then we're going to link them together with a new parent node joining them up together. These interior nodes don't store any letter, just like they didn't when we did it on the whiteboard. Only the leaf nodes do. Then we insert this parent node back into the binary heap. And we'll keep doing that until we have only one node, and then that becomes the root node of the tree. Then we call this fill in codes method, which is doing a recursive thing. So let's look at that one next. So what this is doing is it takes as a parameter the node in the tree that we're doing, and it takes in the code word that we've seen so far. If this is a null reference, we just return because that's sort of our base case. Otherwise, if this is a leaf node and it has a letter, we assign the code into our code array, which we can look at in a second. Then we recursively go down the left side and we add a zero because we took a left path. And we also recursively go down the right side and we add a one because we took the right path. So what this algorithm is essentially doing is it's walking down the tree, sort of traversing it until it gets down to a leaf node. And each left or right decision that it makes when it recurses, it keeps track of that. So we start off here in the root node and we don't put in a code for that because there is no letter stored here. This is not one of our leaf nodes. Then we recursively go to the left and store zero as the word. And then once that whole process is done, we're going to recursively go to the right with the one stored as the word. We're going to track down this tree as we're doing it recursively. And when we hit this node here, our word is going to be equal to zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. And then we're going to store that inside of this array of codes. So it's essentially doing the same thing that we did on the whiteboard. It's just doing it recursively. 
filtering down until we hit one of the nodes that actually has a letter stored inside of it. And then we just look at the path that we've taken to get here and put that in for our code. And then we have lastly this method called compress that takes in a single letter and it looks in that array and gives you back whatever string you got, whatever string of zeros and ones was associated with this letter. Then moving down, we have the main method of this. It takes in as command line arguments the input file and also the output file. It makes the Huffman tree. So in this case, it doesn't even really need to look at the input we're given to make the tree because it's based on sort of the common probabilities. Then we open up our two input files and read from the input file each character as we go. And if it's a new line, we just print it out the same as it was. Um, we could have done this for like spaces and stuff too. So new lines are just passed through. Otherwise, if it's not a new line, we compress it and then we write that word out into the file. Now I did something else here to make this code a little bit simpler, which is that I didn't actually write the output string in binary. So when we write like 001, so this is kind of confusing, but when we write like 001 out into the output file, we're actually writing the ASCII codes for each of these. And so that's a 48 and then a 48 and then a 49 because the ASCII code for num numeral zero is 48 and the ASCII code for numeral one is 49. And so this is eight bits of data to store the 48, eight bits to store the other 48 and eight bits to store the 49. So when we write 001, it's not actually writing it as three bits, it's writing it out as 24 bits. We could have in Java like actually written it out as binary, but it would have made the code a lot more confusing. And it also would have made the output files impossible to read by hand. So when we generate them, they're really going to be bigger than the initial input file, but taking into account the fact that they're not actually stored in binary, we can figure out if we had stored it in binary, how much smaller it would be. All right, so we can compile this program, which is contained in huffman.java, and it also uses the minheap that's stored in minheap.java. And the file I'm going to run it on is ts.txt, which is tomsawyer.txt. It's actually the complete text of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain, except it's entirely consisting of lowercase letters. So I took out all the spaces and all the punctuation and then converted all the capital letters into lowercase letters. So it's just the string of letters that comprise the story. And again, this was just done to keep it as simple a program as possible. So it only deals with these lowercase letters, but all the lowercase letters from the story are actually in here. So let's run it on this input file. So I'm gonna do Java Huffman, and then the input is ts.txt, and let's put the output as out.txt. So the first thing it does is it prints out the tree that gets used for doing the compression. And so you can see that the most common letters like E and T and A and R and S have smaller code words, whereas as you might expect, the letters that are less commonly used like J and Q and X and Z have longer ones. So now let's see how big these files are. TS.txt, it looks like is 316,000 bytes. Whereas the alt.txt, as I said, is a lot larger than that. But remember that this is bigger because we're writing actually eight bits for every bit. So that we actually need to divide this by eight to see how much space this actually would take if we put it in binary. So in order to do that, we can run Python real quick, just as a calculator. And I'll do this number divided by eight. And so we actually got it down quite a bit. So it, instead of taking 316,000 bytes, now in this way, it's actually taking 167,000 bytes. So it's just a little bit more than half the size. So we reduced it by quite a lot. So that's that example. It can be used to compress any lowercase letters using this Huffman tree, which is generated from these probabilities that are given for the letters. There's different things you can do with Huffman coding. We didn't do this, but we could have actually read in the Tom Sawyer text and gone through and counted how many times each letter appeared and use that to build our tree instead, because it's possible that the percentages here weren't exactly accurate for Tom Sawyer. Maybe Tom Sawyer uses more cues because a character's name had Q in it. I don't, I don't know that that's the case, but it would be a little bit better and a little bit more accurate if we actually analyze the text itself.
Now, if we did that, we would have had to store this table inside of our generated output file as well as the generated text because we would need to know what the encoding was to go back the other way. Whereas if we just use sort of this generic one, then we could use that for any English text and it would always work at least pretty well. And then we wouldn't have to store the binary tree, the, the Huffman tree, because it's the same for every single thing that we're doing. This Huffman coding technique is actually the basis for a lot of more complicated and more efficient compression techniques as well. So both JPEG and MP3 actually do use some variant of Huffman coding inside of their schemes. Those also do lossy compression, which we talked about last time. So it's a little bit more complex, but this Huffman tree is sort of a common idea that's used in these compression techniques. The notes page for today has the program here. So if you want to look at this, you can see the Huffman.java file. And we could have extended this, like I said, in a couple of different ways. We could extend it so that it handles capital letters and spaces and stuff like that. We also could have changed it so that it writes the files out actually in binary rather than just writing out zeros and ones as ASCII text. But in order to keep it simple, we, we just kind of made those simplifications. So that's all for, for this week on Huffman coding. I think it's a pretty interesting topic because it gets at something that we haven't really talked about this semester, which is like the way that you actually store data in files. And it also utilizes some of the things we've talked about, like min heaps and trees and arrays and stuff like that. So hopefully it was a good last topic for this class. That's all. And thanks, everyone.